Let's talk to Mark Oswald. He is a strategist at ADMISI. Very good morning to you, young Mark. Good morning. Right, quick recap of the week. Um, I would think, OK, anyone learning economics at the moment would be just loving that there's so many different things going on. Yes, and also a timely reminder that um, economic data is not the be-all and end-all of what drives market sentiment. So we've had this week where we've had a reasonable amount of economic data, the usual bout of PMIs, which have been in the US certainly very encouraging, in Europe perhaps not so, though underlying moment, the underlying growth, the underlying rate of growth suggested by the PMIs is still quite solid. But in the background, of course, we've had all this toing and froing on trade, um, and it's not just uh, the US-China trade tensions, but it's also. We do seem to have had moments where we're suddenly a lot more optimistic on uh, the evolution of the NAFTA negotiations yep. or renegotiations, we should say. So the market's um, caught between looking at that trade side of the equation, which is very understandable. I think um, uh, just in passing, it's worth understanding it's not the trade tariffs that actually do the damage. What would be damaged are supply chains, which have become much, you know, have become very well established. In the first instance, people would have to, because of the cost related to the tariffs, yeah. would have to resource all of that. Okay, that's an expensive process. If right. you have to go through a whole beauty parade of getting a whole new bunch of supplies, that's going to cost you money, and it'll probably end up because the tariffs are in place. Also, meaning you've got higher costs for running your business, for producing your goods. Or your services, so it's it's disrupt it's disruptive from that aspect that it destroys supply chains. And the more we pile on, um, and the the question here is is when do we get the butterfly effect? That one item, perhaps in all of this these trade um, negotiations, where someone basically throws the towel. Um, we had a good example back in um, '62, uh, where uh, the U.S. almost broke. Um, um, the special relationships with the UK, when it sort of basically nicks the, the uh, uh, nuclear program that the UK had been in place, and it was only thanks to the skills of Harold Macmillan in negotiating with the then President, President Kennedy, uh, that the situation was resolved and the old program was got rid of, but the US gave the UK Polaris at a very heavily discounted rate in order to, because they realised it was a special relationship. So it's these butterfly effects that you have where people don't actually think of the consequences of what right. they're doing. It might be a trade tariff which people say, well, that's not very important, is it? Uh, but it can be the straw which breaks the camel's back. So the market's caught between that side yep. and the other side of the equation, which is incoming economic data. And obviously today uh, we have the US Labour Report. Um, it's expected to be another fairly robust one. We're looking for payrolls around about 185,000. Uh, private payrolls, maybe about 190,000. Yes, that's a lot lower than last month, but last month, 330,000 was a true outlier. Um, there is a tendency for March data to be rather weaker simply because um, we are going into spring and therefore the seasonal adjustment pushes down on uh, the amount of uh, jobs which are supposed to be created. But, obviously at the moment, in terms of um, US data, um, it's um, the wages data which are going to be the most important. To be very honest, if they come in as expected, which the consensus is sort of between 0.2 and 0.3 on the month, which edges the year-on-year -year rate up to 2.7 from 2.6, which is slightly below the highs that we saw back in January and September. So in the greater scheme of things, neither here nor there, wage growth is glacially and very gradually going up, but not in a way which is basically going to put any pressure on the Fed, but it does allow them to stick to this very gradualist path. So let's say it's a wash on, on the average early mm. earnings numbers. Then we'll probably look at the non-farm payrolls. Um, I, I think there's plenty of potential there for a surprise, um, both in revision terms. We could see a bit of a downward revision. Um, and because we had a strike in the US, um, during the payroll survey week. So I wouldn't want to overinterpret that. So then we're left with the other two items on the list, uh, whereby the unemployment rate is expected to make a fresh cyclical low at 4%. Now we're at that point where markets, which always suffer from what I call big figure itis, 
if they saw a 3.9, you can guarantee that will be the only topic of conversation. Though materially, what the difference between you know 4, four and 3.9 is probably not, yeah. not actually a lot. Yeah. But it's psychological, and it would have a lot of people thinking, well, maybe the Fed does need to get on with it, and we move to a, a sort of four-rate hike scenario. Obviously, everything very much contingent there on what actually happens with the trade negotiations. And most importantly, we'll, we're going to get some insight this afternoon from Chairman Powell on the economic outlook and indeed incoming New York Fed Chairman, uh, President um, Williams, who I would note for people, do remember this man is the second most important, not the vice chairman. He is the second most important, most important person in monetary policy terms because he is the vice chairman of the FOMC, not of the Fed. So what they think, and they were pretty much front foot on trade, saying basically if we go into a trade war, this is not going to be a good situation. But the unemployment rate, um, the one thing to um, go back to on there, I think, is yes, if we go down to four, that's a fresh low. Yep. However, the underemployment rate yep. is still at 8.2. And as you can see, it's ticked up recently. Um, relative to the last time, which was 2000, that we were at uh, 4% in terms of the unemployment rate. The underemployment rate was back then was around uh, 7%. And I think you probably actually have to say this one's probably higher in relative terms simply because a lot of the jobs which have been created which are full-time are minimum wage jobs. So there are probably a lot of people who are employed who would like to get the upgrade on their jobs to a better paid job. So there's still quite a lot of slack in the labour market right. and that keeps the Fed you know, on an easy path where they can steer things and they can keep an eye on the thing which they don't say matters to them most. I mean, they think, you know, a lot of people think that it's the inflation rate which matters to them most. I don't think they're particularly worried about inflation either direction at the moment. We will see it tick up towards 3%. We're going to get the data next week um, as we go through the first six months of the year, and then it will start to tail off. I think what they're mostly concerned about is financial conditions at the moment. Financial conditions, despite the higher volatility that we've got, despite higher rates, um, despite the widening in credit spreads, of all sorts of type, LIBOR, OIS, or corporate credit spreads, they're still incredibly loose relative to when the Fed started. So if we were to not see any massive tightening in, labor, in financial conditions, then we're going to be in a situation where the Fed can carry on as it is at the moment. But if we go to the next chart, and this is the important one, we keep on talking in markets about why aren't people much longer of the dollar? Yep. You know, um, the break differentials with Europe, with the UK, with Canada even, um, above all with Japan, um, are so favourable for the dollar. And the answer is, as I've said on many an occasion, is everyone's been very short of yen and very long of the dollar for a long period, up until recently. In mid-February, <coughs> mid we still had 110,000 short. That was practically wiped out by the end of the last reporting period, which was the week to Tuesday last week. We get the new data today, Right. it may go into positive territory, and then we are in a situation where the market's very long of euros, uh, about 140,000 contracts, they'll be long of yen, they're long of sterling, uh, a little bit long of uh, Canadian dollars, and we'll be in a situation where suddenly the boot's on the other foot, because no longer will it be the short yen position which will be squeezed, potential, have potential for a squeeze, but the short dollar position, and that has always been the prerequisite for setting the baseline for how we might get a dollar rally once, hopefully, we get into a situation where the trade, situ trade tensions start to ebb a bit. On that note, Mark, brilliant stuff, thought-provoking. Thank you very much indeed.